Thank you, Hannah. You know, he really did take our place on the cross. He wore the crown, the cross, everything should have been ours. But looking at Hebrews chapter 13 tonight, um, I mentioned this verse a lot lately. We're just going to look at one verse here, and then we're going to go through a whole lot of the Bible. Um, but Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Um, I forgot to mention when we did prayer requests, but pray for our missionaries, Michael and Lynette Joseph. They had an adopted daughter. I think it said she was about 12. I don't remember. She was 11, and she just died. So pray for Michael and Lynette. So they had her, I think they said, five, six years. So pray for them. Um, but Hebrews chapter 13 tonight, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Paul's writing, and this verse just talks about Jesus, how he's always been the same God. So tonight we're just going to look at through Jesus' life and then how that affects our life now and in the future. So Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. So let's pray. God, as we come to your presence today, Lord, just thank you so much that we get to come read your word, Lord, just that we have the freedom just to be saved because of what you did for us, just to come worship you. You've always been the same things that will always get to worship you, Lord. And Lord, I just thank you for each one here tonight. I pray you speak to each of us, speak through me, help it to be your words, not mine. Just fill us all with your spirit, let us glorify you. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So Hebrews chapter 13, Verse 8 simply says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. So turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, we'll see Jesus in the very beginning of time. You know, Jesus is God, so he's always been. It wasn't just in his birth. Jesus has always been. And that's what the Apostle John says right here. The Apostle John, in John chapter 1, just talks about Jesus in the beginning, at creation, you know. When God created the world, he said, let us make man in our image. And that was the Trinity. Jesus was there during creation. Right. But in John chapter 1, John records, in the beginning, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, excuse me, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So we see Jesus is God. So when it says he's the same yesterday and today and forever, He's been around forever. He has never started. Once he's never changed. God has always been the same. Right. And we see Jesus is the creator. Christ is the creator. Verse 3 says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. And then when we go down to verse 10, it says, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. So Jesus Christ, the one who took our thorns, he took our crown, he took our cross, you know, he was the creator of the whole world. Everything he created, he then had to die to save each and every one of us. You know, Jesus Christ was the creator, but he also died for us. Um, just some other verses, if you go to Colossians chapter one. Colossians chapter 1 is another one that talks about Jesus and eternity past. Just again, talks about Jesus before birth in Colossians 1. If you want to turn to one right now, go ahead. But Colossians chapter 1, Paul says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. So obviously, we have redemption through Christ's blood. Christ is the one that saves us. So we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. So Colossians 1 says, we have redemption through his blood, but he's the image of the invisible God. We can't see God, but Christ was able to be seen because he had a physical body. Right. Colossians 1 verse 16 says, for by him were all things created. All things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Christ created everything. Our right. Savior, the one who died for us, created everything. And by all things, and by him all things consist. Christ is the one that keeps everything going. Everything is sustained by Christ. Colossians 1.18 says, And he is the head of the body, 
the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Amen. Preeminence, I heard it explained, is whatever is number one in your life should be Christ. And when Christ is preeminent, he's number one, and then number two, three, four don't exist, it's whatever he wants it to be. That's preeminent. So when Christ is the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, Christ the Creator died for us, he was buried, he rose again, that he could be absolute number one. Nothing is number two to Christ. Christ is absolute number one. That's right. Amen. And then, you know, Micah, when he prophesied his birth, when Micah proph prophesied Christ's birth, we start turning to Matthew chapter one if you want to. We see Christ in eternity, even when his birth was prophesied. Christ in eternity passed, Micah said, but thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. I've always heard that, I've always noticed that, but I never noticed the last part of this verse. Micah 5, 2 says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, we know that the prophecy of Christ, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. We know he's to be ruler, but whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So when Micah prophesied his birth, he said, look, this king is going to be born in Bethlehem, but this is the king that's been since way before any of us were ever born. He's before creation. He's always been. So then we get to Matthew 1. We see his birth prophesied. We see Christ the creator, Christ in eternity past. But as we get to, my, as, to Matthew chapter 1, we see this creator, the almighty, who can do anything, the creator come down and be born as a human. Matthew chapter 1, 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as Mary his mother was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not only to make her a public example, was minded to put her away. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. You see, Mary was a virgin, and Christ, not only the Creator, but also the miracle child. Christ the child was born of a virgin. He was conceived of the Holy Ghost. Verse 21 says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, Mary, a virgin, was with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Amen. So we see Isaiah 7.14, that's the reference of the prophecy here. Isaiah 7.14, Jesus would come and he would be the Emmanuel, God with us. That creator that's been around forever and ever before time began, he now came to be a man as a little child. Right. You know, the song says, there's a song that Brother Delaney always comes and sings around Christmas time. He says, the wonder of wonders as she looked on his face, that this little boy spoke the world into place. The stars and the moon shining brightly on them. The earth and the sun were created by him. The wonder of wonders, oh how could it be that God became flesh and was given for me? The Almighty came down and walked among men. The wonder of wonders, he died for my sins. The wonder of wonders, as she looked down and smiled, that he was her maker as well as her child. He created the womb that had given him birth. He was God incarnate from down to the earth. The wonder of wonders, as she heard his small cry, that this voice had thundered on Mount Sinai. Right. The small hand she held so tenderly, so tenderly, had made a dry path through the mighty Red Sea. The wonder of wonders, oh how could it be, that God became flesh and was given for me. The Amen. Almighty came down and walked among men. A wonder of wonders, he died for our sins. Amen. You know, right. this creator that created everything we've ever seen, he then came down, all-powerful God came down into the form of a baby. Right. So we see Christ is the creator, Christ was the child, 
But then all through his life, we just see Christ was consistent. You know, he's the creator. He comes out as a baby. But then Luke 2, 49, his parents brought him to Jerusalem. He's about 12 years of age. And they bring him to Jerusalem. And they lose him. They're leaving. And someone said they literally lost the Christ child. They leave. They're down the road a long ways with the whole family, whole caravan. They completely lose Jesus. They find him in the temple. He's talking to doctors and lawyers. And they said, why did you leave us? And he said unto them, how is it, he's 12 years old now, how is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Right. He says, look, why won't you think, I, why did you think I was in my father's business? He says, look, God is my father. I'm in what he wants us to. And we see then in Luke 2.52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So Jesus, from a young age, is doing his father's business, and he begins to increase in wisdom, he increases mentally in stature physically, and in favor with God spiritually and with man socially. Jesus is now growing, but the whole time, all through his life, we see Christ was consistent. He was consistently right. sinless. You know, Luke 3, 23, John baptized him when he began to be about 30 years of age. So Jesus is baptized, he's then tempted in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights, he fasts, the devil tempts him, he just quotes God's word to the devil, Right. and then he begins his earthly ministry. While on earth, he heals the sick, he raises the dead, he casts out demons, and he preaches repentance to all, the whole time he's maintaining his consistent walk with God. Christ, not only the creator, the one that came down as a child, while on earth, he's consistent, he never sinned. Right. You know, that's why we have the promise in Hebrews 4.15. For we have not an high priest. Christ is our high priest. We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Amen. Christ was the creator. He was the child, but he was consistent all through his life. Amen. See, Christ is and he still is consistent during our lives. Eternity past when he was the creator, when he was the child, all through his life, all through eternity, as we read to start off with, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Sure. Christ will never, ever change. Though he was God, he became a human, still 100% God, 100% man. Amen. He's always the same. He's always consistent. And he never sinned. So as we start turning to John chapter 19, John chapter 19, we see Christ never changes, but through his life, as he's preaching, he's healing people, he raises Lazarus from the dead, he's doing all these great things, but the people around Christ start to change. You know, he has a ton of followers, and as you turn to John 19, I'm going to go to John 6. As he's turning to, as he is preaching in John 6, he says, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So Christ has all these followers, and then he says, look, if you do not partake of my flesh, drink of my blood, you do not take my salvation, you have no eternal life in you. Right. So there's all these crowds, but when Christ preached this, it says, then from that day forth, then it says a lot of them left, and then as John, a lot of them left him, and then as Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. He finishes. He's going on. But John records that after he raised Lazarus from the dead, then from that day forth, they, the Pharisees, took counsel together for to put him to death. And at this point, as you guys are in John chapter 19, we see Christ is the creator. He was the child. He was consistent all through his life. Yet Christ becomes, as Galatian puts it, Christ becomes the cursed. He became cursed for us. So John chapter 19, we see in verse 23, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier part and also his coat. Now the coat was without a seam and woven from the top throughout. And so they split his coat, they're mocking him, and then in verse 28, we see Christ is now cursed. After this, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that in the scripture, or that, sorry, 
After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. You know, Christ, the creator, the child, the consistent, the God who made everything, has now died for that who that he created. Each of us that he created, all the humans back then, every human ever Christ created, but he now has died for them. Isaiah prophesied that in Isaiah 53. He says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Yeah, he was man. bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so openeth he not his mouth. We see in 2 Corinthians, For he hath, God hath made him, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin. He was consistent. He knew no sin. But he became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In Romans 5, 8, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ, the Creator, the Child, the Consistent, this Holy God has now died for us. In Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hang up, hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Christ who has created everything He breathed life into each and every one of us He's been around forever He left heaven to come live on earth To die for us He took the curse of the law He became our curse The curse that should have been ours That cross should have been ours The crown, the thorns, everything should have been ours But Christ took the curse for us You know, the Almighty God now came To die for us But you know, the story doesn't end there Christ not only became a curse he also rose again from the dead as the conqueror. Amen. You know, Matthew 28, Mary and Martha, or Mary and Mary Magdalene are going up to the tomb. They're going to see their Lord that has now died. Can you imagine those three days of confusion that Peter felt? You know, his Lord, the one who just told him not to chop off the soldier's ear. Mary, who had healed him of all her problems, who Christ had healed her of all her problems, set the demons free from her. All these people that followed him, looked up to him, he's now dead. But as Mary and Mary Magdalene walk up to this tomb, they see the angels and they say, He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. See, Christ is still Almighty God. He didn't just die as our curse. He didn't take the curse for us and just end there. But he told John in Revelation 1, he said, and John recorded, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. You know, Christ was not conquered by death. He did not he died as our curse, but he rose again from the dead. He lives forevermore. So why did this... Holy God, the one that had the power just to speak the world into existence, why did he come and send his son to die for us? Or why did he send his son to die on earth, to become a little baby, to raise up, to have a ministry for three and a half years just to die for us? So that if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be saved. Right. Paul told the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. You know, Jesus died because... Our sins will take us to hell for all eternity. Mm-hmm. You know, if we had that curse laid on us, there's nothing we could do to ever escape the lake of fire. We'd be in hell burning for all eternity. 
But God commended his love toward us in that while each of us, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Very true. You know, our wages of sin is death, but that gift of God, that son that he sent us, the eternal God dying for us, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You know, Jesus died so that we could live. He died, he was buried, he rose again so we could enter into heaven. Amen. And you know, today, Christ is our intercessor. He's the conversing Christ. Christ ascended to heaven 40 days after he rose from the dead. And Acts 1.9 says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So God has now, Christ has now left the earth, and he's ever living to intercede for us. Hebrews 7.25 says, Amen. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. You know, when we go to God, the Christ that died for us, when we accept him, he saves us to the absolute uttermost. Right. You know, we're saved forever. Nothing can change that. God saved us to the uttermost. He saves them to the uttermost that come into, to God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. You know, Christ died for us. He saves us to the uttermost. And he today is praying for us. He's spending time with God, telling him he's praying to God for us, interceding for us. You know, Christ is in heaven interceding for us, but one day he's going to come again. The God that created everything, that came as a child, grew up, lived a sinless life, died for us, and rose again. He's going to come back one day to receive us. That's right. Acts 1, 9 through 11 says, we start turning to 1 Thessalonians if you would. But Acts chapter 1, verse 9 says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up in a cloud, received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, so they're looking towards heaven when he goes up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, so shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. They looked at the angels, looked at the disciples, and they said, Look, just like you saw him go up into heaven, He's going to come back. So this Christ that died for us, that is able to save anyone that believes on him to the absolute uttermost, he saves them. He's going to come back for us. Amen. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul is talking about here the uh, coming of Christ, the rapture of the saints. In 1 Thessalonians 4, in verse 13, he's talking to the Thessalonian church. He says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. He doesn't want us to not know this. He wants us to get this. Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. He says, look, we as Christians, when we've accepted the eternal God, we've accepted Christ as our Savior, we don't need to have no hope. We have hope. We can hope forever. We do not need to be like those that have no hope. Right. He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He says, look, if we believe in Christ, those others that believe in Christ too, we have hope that they're going to come back from the dead. We're going to see them again. Verse 15, he says, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. This is God's word. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. So if we're here and Christ comes back that it remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So if we are still here, we're not going to prevent them which are asleep. You know, those that are asleep that have already died in Christ, verse 16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So those that are already asleep will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You know, we can find comfort in our Christ coming back for us. That one who became a human, came seemingly a helpless baby. He came, left all his power and glory and majesty in heaven. He came here to be born to a poor family. He grew up, ministered, he was consistent. He died on the cross, was rose again. He's interceding for us now, but he is going to come back for us. Right. You know what? 
The rapture is going to happen, and then one day the second coming of Christ is going to happen. So turn over to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. You know, Christ is coming for his own, but one day when he comes again, he will punish the earth. And that's why even though we have comfort in these words, it should bring to our attention that we should probably be going out telling others about Christ. Because he's going to come and take us home, but others that are left here that have not accepted Christ as Savior, they'll be punished. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, this is why God, Christ said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Because if they remain through the tribulation, if they die before the tribulation, they'll go to hell, they'll burn for all eternity. But then those that are left after Christ's first coming, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, John says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. He is, this man is speaking about his Christ. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God. And he hath written on his vesture and on his thigh, name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great king, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beasts, and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against them that sat on the horse, and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant which were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls of the, all the fowls, all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And then turn to Revelation twenty fourteen. It says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and verse 15 says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Right. So we see Christ coming for us. If we're saved, that is incredible. We can be comforted knowing no matter what goes on today, Christ is going to come back for us for comfort. But what about those who aren't saved around us? You know, we can't leave them to live for this. You know? We can't leave them just to die and go to the lake of fire. So though we're comforted, we shouldn't be keeping that to ourselves. The Old Testament reports a story in Kings. And a couple of lepers, they were going to die. They were starving. The lepers, they were cast out of the city. They could not go into the city once they got sick. So they said, look, if we stay here and die, if we stay here and not eat, we're going to die. But there's a camp of the Assyrians over there. Maybe they'll take us in. And if not, we're going to die. So basically, no matter what we do, we're going to die. So they said, you know what, we're going to go over to this camp of the Syrians. But God had worked it out. He had confused the Syrians. And they had went running out of their camp. They were so scared, they left everything they had. So these Syrians go up, they find all this treasure. And the whole country is in a land of, uh, is, is in a famine. So these lepers, I'm sorry, the lepers go up to the Syrians' camp. And they find all the food, the jewels, everything you could ever want. In this camp. So while they're going through it, they look at each other and they say, We're not doing right. We need to tell our land, tell our people around us what we found. If we keep this to ourselves, everyone else is going to die. You know, Christ, when he came and died for us, he was buried, he rose again, he gave us the greatest comfort we could ever imagine. Right. But we should not keep that to ourselves. We should go and tell others. Just go tell somebody what Christ has done for you. You say, Micah? 
I don't know all of the verses. I don't know what all I should say. Well, just tell them what Christ did for you. And honestly, even though I memorized the Romans Road, I memorized all the verses, if you ask me on the spot, you can ask a couple people here. If you ask me something on the spot, I'm going to flat forget it. So you say, Mike, how on earth am I supposed to tell someone about God if I can't remember the verses? You take a track and you just read through them. You say, this is what this verse says. This is what this verse says. And you just take them through. And you can tell them what Christ did for you through his word. Just by having one of these tracks, the Romans Road ones are my favorite. I think I have some back here. These ones are my favorite. The Romans Road. But if you take these out and you just leave them somewhere, someone could go up behind you in the bathroom, wherever they're at. Don't listen. We went to Olivia's uncle the other day. His house. He lives here in Lancaster. And he's like, man, somebody from your church is hitting every single stupid gas station in town. <laughs> every single time I pull up, he's a pastor too, he's like, you know, I hand out tracks, but every single time I go to the gas station, someone from your church has left a track. There is always a Bible Baptist church track. <laughs> he's like, you know what, though? That's awesome. Because... He just, we all just want our, our city, our town, our nation, everyone to be reached. Amen. So we Amen. need to keep leaving these out because if someone picks that up and they read it, they know now how to have this comfort that the eternal God can bring us. They know that now that Christ came, he died for us, he was buried, he rose again. So they don't have to endure this punishment. They don't have to go to the lake of fire. Christ can take that curse for them and they can go to heaven for all eternity. Amen. So this week, if right now if you're not saved, that's the most important part. Even if you Everyone thinks you're saved no matter what. Accepting Christ, you can have that comfort. You don't have to have that punishment. So accept him tonight. But yeah. each and every one of us, if we're having a hard day, we have the comfort of knowing. The songwriter said, things are bound to get much better either way. No matter what happens, it can get better on earth. If not, it's going to get better in heaven. Right. You know, while we have that comfort, we need to share that comfort with others. Tell others what Christ has done for us. Right. So as heads are bowed, eyes are closed, as the piano players come in, as we all stand, this week, let's just tell others about this eternal God, the Christ who did so much for and for us. Let's tell them about him. Whatever the need is tonight as we stand, feel free to come and pray at the altar and leave. Remember, Christ can do anything for us. So feel free.